The hearing will come to order. Good morning. Prescription drugs are vital to the health and well-being of Americans, especially our nation's seniors, 90% of whom take at least one prescription drug in any given month. For many Americans, access to affordable prescription drugs is not only critical for health, but also can be literally a matter of life or death. Developing these medicines is a lengthy, expensive, and uncertain process. It often takes more than a decade to bring a new drug from the laboratory to the market. The process is often very costly, and most drugs fail during testing. If we want new medicines to reach consumers who need them, the companies that invest in the research and take the risks necessary to develop these drugs must see a fair return on their investment. At the same time, we cannot be blind to the costs of these drugs, nor to cases where patent laws are manipulated to preserve monopolies. Americans are expected to spend more than $387 billion on prescription drugs this year alone. Of this amount, individuals will pay about $48 billion out of pocket. The federal government is a major payer and will pick up another $172 billion in payments through Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Affairs, and other programs. And of course, the cost of prescription drugs affects what we pay for private health insurance as well. While we understand that research and development are expensive, consumers are also familiar with reports of prescription drugs that have undergone significant and unwarranted price increases. Last Congress, this committee conducted a bipartisan investigation into the sudden dramatic price increases of certain decades-old prescription drugs. At the end of our investigation, we published a report documenting cases in which, the comp in which companies that had not invested a single dollar in the research and the development of a drug nevertheless bought it hiked its price to an unconscionable level. Today, the committee will examine why prices have soared for drugs used to treat a disease affecting 1.3 million Americans, rheumatoid arthritis, a chronic anti-immune and inflammatory condition that attacks the linings of joints. Untreated, RA can lead to permanent joint damage and is associated with significant morbidity. While it can begin at any age, the likelihood of onset increases with age and is highest among women in their 60s. Biologic medicines have proven life-changing for many patients, halting the progression of symptoms and allowing them to remain actively engaged at work, at home, and in life. Derived from living organisms, biologics are much more complex than their chemical counterparts. They may require special handling and are often administered by injection or infusion. Sometimes referred to as specialty drugs, these medicines can have astonishingly high price tags that are continuing to increase e every year. For example, the price of Humira, a self-administered biologic approved at the end of 2002 to treat RA, has risen from about $19,000 per year in 2012 to more than $38,000 per year today. Enbrel, another biologic that was first approved for treatment of RA in 1998, costs about the same. Sales of Humira reached $16.1 billion in 2016. It is the world's best-selling pharmaceutical drug, and Enbrel is number three. 
the FDA approved biosimilars for both Humira and Embrel in 2016, but neither has come to market. That's disturbing since we know that competition tends to drive down prices or at least curb increases. In the case of Remicade, a less expensive biologic approved for treatment of RA, two biosimilars did come to market at discounts of 15 and 35 percent. That raises the important question. Why haven't the biosimilar competitors of Humira and Embrel become available to consumers? According to reports, Humira is covered by more than 100 patents, many of which were added as the expiration date of the drug's main patent approached in 2016. Similarly, Embrel's main patent has expired, yet the drug remains protected by at least two other so-called submarine patents nearly 20 years after it was first approved by the FDA. According to a CRS report from 2017, five of the seven biosimilars that have been approved by the FDA, quote, have been delayed or alleged to have been adversely impacted by actions of the brand name manufacturers. Treating rheumatoid arthritis costs the U.S. healthcare system an estimated $19 billion a year. As a result of the increasing costs of these vital drugs, we hear of the struggles of older Americans who face not only the pain of the disease, but also the financial pain associated with maintaining treatments. One of these patients is my constituent, Patty Bernard. She is among the more than 8,000 people in Maine who live with rheumatoid arthritis. Mrs. Bernard is 80 years old, and she was, hope you don't mind that we told your age at this hearing, and she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at age 55. In the early years of her diagnosis, she tried many different drugs, but her symptoms continued to get worse. In 1998, when Enbrel came to market, she was one of the first in Maine to try the drug. She calls the medicine God-given. Joint by joint, she felt her life come back. When Mrs. Bernard retired last year, she learned that on Medicare, she would have to pay $3,800 per month for the medication, an unaffordable cost. We look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today and to better understanding what can be done to moderate the price of prescription drugs without discouraging the innovation that helps us live healthier lives. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I now turn to our ranking member, Senator Casey, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Collins, for holding this hearing today. We want to thank our witnesses for your presence here and your testimony. Over 54 million Americans are living with arthritis, including 3 million just in the state of Pennsylvania alone. The prevalence of arthritis uh, increases with age. Half of Americans ages 65, age 65 and older are diagnosed with arthritis, and women are at a greater risk of arthritis than men. Three times more women than men are living with rheumatoid arthritis, as the chairman noted. She also noted this is one of the more severe types of this disease. The sheer number of people who may be diagnosed with arthritis gives us good reason to examine this illness and its treatments. We must promote pathways to foster innovation and promote access to life-changing medications. Indeed, with the emergence of novel treatments for rheumatoid arthritis over the last two decades, people are living longer, fuller lives. But these treatments are not always affordable. One of our witnesses here today, Dr. Harvey, will tell us 
about the impact this has had on patients. Americans living with arthritis, just like any other disease or condition, must be able to access and afford the treatments they need. No baby boomer or senior should go without care simply because the price tag is too high or the out-of-pocket cost is too great. No one should live in fear that, that one day they won't be able to afford the medicine that allows them to live and work in their community. It's for this reason that I was pleased to help close the Medicare prescription drug coverage gap, known by that benign phrase, donut hole, as part of the Affordable Care Act. O already, since that time, over 275,000 Pennsylvanians with Medicare saved almost $1.6 billion on their prescription medications because of this change. Now, that's the good news. But as we'll hear today, there is much more that can be done to ensure that seniors and people with disabilities can afford life-sustaining and life-saving treatments. These are issues that span research and innovation, regulatory approvals, market forces, and coverage. Our witnesses will shed light onto these different factors and more. I look forward to the committee's discussion. And Madam Chair, I would note for the record that two of our witnesses have roots in Pennsylvania. But once they move out, I can't claim them. <laughs> Dr. Hoadley as well as Dr. Harvey. But we're grateful they're here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also want to uh, welcome uh, Senator Cortez Mastro and Senator Fisher to our hearing today. I uh, will now move to the introductions of our witnesses. Our first witness is Patricia Bernard from Falmouth, Maine. Mrs. Bernard, as I explained in my opening statement, lives with rheumatoid arthritis. Her condition was debilitating, but with the advent of biologic therapies, she's gained control over her condition and her life. She was stable with Embrel for nearly two decades until she retired at 79 and could no longer receive the drug once she transitioned to Medicare. She will describe her journey with rheumatoid arthritis and the impact of the skyrocketing cost of treatment. Dr. William Harvey is the director of the Division of Rheumatology at Tufts University School of Medicine. He's also a longstanding member of the College of American College of Rheumatology, and he will share his experiences as a physician, not only diagnosing and treating seniors, but also serving as an advocate to help his patients obtain and maintain the treatment they need in the face of soaring costs. Also joining us today is Dr. Jack Hoadley. Dr. Hoadley has 30 years of experience in the health policy field and currently conducts research on healthcare financing at Georgetown University's Health Policy Institute. He is a member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Council, better known as MedPAC. We also welcome Terry Mon, a distinguished attorney and managing principal of Fish and Richardson's Washington, D.C. office. He is also group leader for the firm's regulatory and governmental affairs practice and an advisor for Bloomberg's BNA's pharmaceutical law and industry report. We look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, after listening to this uh, wonderful testimony and, and moving testimony, um, I guess it's no surprise that the attorney talking about patents is at the end. Um, I hope I don't bring this hearing down. Um, my testimony today will focus on intellectual property, patents to be more precise, and the important role that they play in driving the discovery and development of new drugs and medical therapies. I'll try to relate how patent protection can impact the cost of drugs and healthcare generally, and I'll try to offer some insights on how these forces can be kept in balance. And before I say anything further, please understand that these comments are mine alone do not reflect the uh, thoughts or views of my law firm or any of its clients. Uh, every spring, I co-teach a three-day patent course on the Hatch-Waxman Act and the law of biosimilars. 
I be, always begin the course by pointing out two related statistics that frame the issues for the rest of the uh, session. The first statistic underscores the low probability of success associated with new drug discoveries. And the second statistic highlights the extraordinarily high cost of bringing a new drug discovery to market. First, the probabilities. According to the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association, for every five to 10,000 new compounds, newly discovered compounds with therapeutic potential, only, five, uh, only 250 actually make their way into preclinical testing, only five into quality, uh, to qualify for clinical trials, and then only one results in an approved drug. So you start with five to 10,000 new discoveries to produce one drug. Second, the costs. According to Tufts University, um, which has modeled the cost of developing new drugs for well over a decade, in 2015, the fully loaded cost of bringing a new drug to market exceeded $2.5 billion. Any way you look at the state of the facts are indisputable. Drug development is an enormously costly and risky business. Because the pharmaceutical business is essential to our public health, however, our legal system must properly incentivize and appropriately reward its risk takers. This is where the patent system comes in. In exchange for publicly disclosing new drug discoveries, the law grants patent owners a monopoly on those discoveries or inventions for a limited time. Ideally, this should only be long enough for patent owners to recover their investment and return a reasonable profit. After that, these new drug developers should be willing to face market competition so the public will benefit from, from, from lower cost medications. In fact, this was one of the important goals of the 1984 Hatch-Waxman Act. And after 34 years of tinkering, uh, Congress has amended the act about a dozen times. Many would argue that Congress now has it just about right. Today, 85% of all prescriptions are filled with generic drugs. 35% of all industry revenues go to generic manufacturers. Yet brand investment in new drug research and development is at an all-time high, exceeding over $100 billion annually. More tellingly, perhaps, in 2017, FDA approved more novel drugs than in any year over the previous decade. So, from the data, it looks like this legislation is working well for the American public. Still, achieving the brand generic balance has not been the smoothest of roads. At its core, Hatch-Waxman radically simplifies the drug approval process by allowing generic applicants to piggyback on the proprietary clinical data strictly required for brand drug approval. In return, the generic must await the expiry of brand patents, which are listed in the FDA's orange book, or it must challenge those patents for earlier market entry. If challenged, the Hatch-Waxman Act affords the brand an opportunity to litigate those patents prior to generic launch. The math then becomes simple. The more patents obtained for a drug, the longer the litigation, the slower the entry of generic drugs. Even after a generic drug is approved for launch, if patent litigation is ongoing, the potential damages for infringement can be enormous, such as lost profits. That's a risk that's too great for most generic companies to bear. Thus, under the original Hatch-Waxman scheme, brand manufacturers were incentivized to list as many patents as possible in the FDA's orange book and then litigate them aggressively as a business uh, strategy to slow down competition and preserve their market share. This patent gathering tactic has been pejoratively called evergreening. Congress through legislation and FDA through various rulemakings over the years have taken deliberate steps to stop patent evergreening. But those efforts have only been partially effective. A recent study by Hastings College of Law examined the types of patents submitted for orange book listing between 2005 and 2015 and concluded that it's still alive. For example, the study found that 74% of patents listed over this period were for previously approved drugs. 80 of the top 100 selling drugs listed a new patent at least once, 50 listed a new patent more than once, and 40% of all drugs listed new patents, with 80% of those listing patents more than once, and some as many as 20 times. Um, in addition, brands have ventured into other areas uh, uh, to assert their patents, including the patenting of uh, REMS programs, uh, entering into pay-for-delay settlement uh, agreements and implementing so-called product hopping, hopping strategies. Nonetheless, and despite anecdotal evidence, it's my belief from all the available data that Hatch-Waxman balance is working as intended as both new and, drug, uh, and generic drug businesses seem to be thriving. I don't want to run over my time too much, but I have a few things to say about the biologic space, so I'll go quickly. So what about the biologic drug side? Well, in two, as we know, until 2010, the U.S. drug laws did not provide an abbreviated approval pathway for Me Too Biologics, known as biosimilars. The Affordable Care Act sought to change that with new rules for approvable uh, 
for approving biologic drugs that were loosely modeled on the Hatch-Waxman scheme, yet stark differences remain. Most biologic drugs are produced by living organisms and thus are very large molecules, very difficult to characterize, and almost impossible to duplicate even from batch to batch. For this reason, biosimilars must be studied much more carefully than small molecule generics to determine their therapeutic equivalence to the brand drug. Clinical trials and detailed scientific analyses are required for bio biosimilars, resulting in an approval process that is slower and, uh, and much more expensive than for generic drugs. Moreover, full substitutability for, of a biosimilar for a brand drug, which is automatic in the generic world, requires separate FDA licensing under the law, a process that has yet to be fully developed or understood. Accordingly, only the most financially well-heeled manufacturers can afford to enter the biosimilar space, which understandably limits future competition. Still, the rewards are tantalizing. In 2015, for example, nine of the top 10 best-selling drugs in the world were biologics that averaged over $8 billion in annual sales. As one would expect, patents play an important role in the development of biologic drugs and the market entry of biosimilars, only more so as compared to small molecule generics. First, due to the complexity of these molecules and the processes required to grow them, many more opportunities exist for securing patent protection. Take Humira, for example. In 2015, we counted 76 patents that protected this $16 billion franchise. By 2017, the number was over 100 and still growing. Second, the biosimilar legislation creates an elaborate scheme involving two potential waves of patent litigation prior to biosimilar launch. Although the Supreme Court ruled last year that the first wave is optional, it does not diminish the fact that a large portfolio of patents presents an equally large barrier to entry. So to summarize, as of this date, as we've heard from uh, 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 Chairman Collins and others, FDA has approved uh, only a handful of biosimilar drugs, nine to be specific, five in 2017 alone, three of which are now on the market. Patent litigation is tying up 18 other biosimilar applicants with, uh, who have approved or pending applications. And early pricing only shows a 15% discount off of the brand biologic, 35% in the case of the second ge uh, generic for uh, Remicade that has entered the market. Several reasons for this small discount um, that you don't see on the generic side. Much higher regulatory cost to market entry, fewer anticipated competitors, no assurances of automatic substitution, thus requiring much higher direct marketing to physicians and hospitals, and the significantly higher cost for manufacturing. An example in Europe may tell a story. It's ahead of the U.S. in biosimilar approvals. Um, uh, yet the discounted from the brand, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, three biosimilars are on the market for Remicade in Europe, um, yet the discount from the brand drug is only 45%. The comparable discount for a three-competitor generic drug would be in the vicinity of 85%. I've attached to my testimony a year-end blog prepared by my firm that contains some relevant data on pricing that should be instructed to the committee. Thank you again for this opportunity to appear. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Mr. Mann, uh, you mentioned a particular uh, device that is used, which I'm wondering why we just don't crack down on or why the uh, the FTC doesn't prevent, and that is pay for delay. Uh, could you explain how that can prevent a biosimilar or a generic drug, in the case of a chemical compound, from coming to the market? Thank you, <coughs> Thank you for that question, Senator Collins. Uh, pay for delay commonly refers to uh, an agreement between a brand uh, uh, and generics, one or two, or one or more generics, um, that uh, keep the generic off the drug um, based on um, patent rights. In other words, um, the patent is asserted by the brand, uh, the generic is at risk of infringing the patent, and so the brand pays the generic money uh, to stay off the market until the patent expires. And they basically settle up front a litigation that could cost them a lot of money. Uh, the brand makes out, the generic makes out, the consumer does not make out. Um, when those pay for delay settlements are for a legitimate um, purpose, which is related to the, the patent and its, its fair licensing, um, they're acceptable under the law, as the Federal Trade Commission has said. But when they're, when they're anti-competitive or there's other ulterior purposes uh, that the parties have in mind, uh, can be actionable, and the FTC has brought actions against 
uh, some of these companies for pay for delay. There has been a Supreme Court decision on the matter, and there's been a cracking down on pay for delay, and it's much more difficult nowadays uh, for those agreements to withstand muster. You suggested in your testimony that there are times when the brand name manufacturers files for a lot of additional patents. And we've noticed in our research this often happens when the initial patent is getting close to the expiration date. And that at times uh, there are very minor changes that are made in packaging, for example, uh, that are used to justify additional patents. Could you talk to us generally about patent thickets and evergreening. You mentioned evergreening um, in your testimony, but could you help us better understand the role that plays? Uh, thank you, Chairman Collins. So when you talk about the patent thicket or evergreening, uh, it, just, it just means really if you're a manufacturer assembling a portfolio uh, that protects the franchise. Uh, AbbVie brags about it in their, in their public statements. Um, they brag that their portfolio is so uh, formidable that they expect to have the market to themselves through 2022 or 23. Um, now, if you look at the two suits that AbbVie has filed um, uh, to protect Hamira, the um, and this is the two waves of litigation I talked about under the under the uh, BPCIA, the Biosimilars Laws. Under the first wave, they're litigating I think six or eight patents against both of the biosimilar entrants that have been, have been approved. And they stated that in the second wave, they're gonna assert another 60 some patents. Well, that doesn't add up to 100. <laughs> so there's 30 or 40 that don't apply. And, and, and that's, a, that's a telling story, which is that a lot of these patent thickets um, are to, you know, to just be formal, to, to scare, uh, to say, look, there's a lot that we can throw at you. Now, you can't throw justifiably throw invalid patents. Uh, you can't throw patents that don't uh, reasonably, uh, aren't reasonably uh, infringed. So you, you, as, a, as a lawyer representing a client with a large portfolio, you can't just assert it because it's been granted. It has to be, there has to be some good faith basis, rule 11 we call it, in litigation, before you can, you can um, assert those things. So a lot of times the thicket has a lot of underbrush that really doesn't matter. Uh, in other cases, uh, a lot of these patents are perfectly good patents. They cover perfectly sound discoveries and inventions, but they're not going to stop competition. They, they just won't. Um, an example, uh, which actually it's, it's funny, it's anecdotal. I, I was, had some uh, antihistamine uh, issues, and so I was seeing a doctor and he gave me a prescription after I had gone through some stuff. He says, here, try this. And I went to the um, pharmacy, and they said, so your, your insurance won't cover this because it's, you know, it's not generic. So I thought, oh, great, so I'll have to pay out of pocket. So I went back to my doctor, and I said, what's this about? And he goes, oh, he says, here, here's the other prescription. I said, what's that? He says, it's the exact same drug, only you take it twice a day rather than once a day. And my insurance company covered it completely. Well, I thought that was pretty fair. I mean, if they said you want to pay more for once a day or nothing for twice a day, now that was because a patent on a once-a-day uh, application was issued, protected, it's also known as product hopping, where you take a product that you've built a market around and then you move it as the competition comes after you to some new use um, or some new convenience that the market then begins to accept quickly and then nobody wants the old stuff. Well, in a perfect system, a lot of people would want the old stuff. They'd say, okay, look, you've got a, something that's more convenient. Somebody has to pay for that. You're entitled to recover the, the, the investment you made to get, make that more convenient. And I'm not willing to pay for it. I'm happy with the old stuff. But the market doesn't smoothly work that way. So a lot of these patents add things on to drugs, but that doesn't mean a generic cannot come along or a biosimilar cannot come along and get approval for non-infringing features and aspects and uses and so forth to avoid those patents. And, and that's what happens in many cases. Thank you. Senator Casey. You're upset. Okay. I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony today. It is a difficult challenge for Congress to come up with the right response 
uh, to the issue of escalating costs of prescription drugs. It involves complicated patent issues, as we've just heard. It involves uh, the prior authorization problems that uh, insurers impose on providers. It involves uh, policies of Medicare that are different than private insurers and can impose enormous costs on patients as they age into the Medicare program. And it involves our desire to make sure that we do, that we prevent these flagrant abuses of the system uh, that has led to an escalation of costs without justification, without dampening or discouraging the innovation that brings us these wonderful biologics and other drugs that make such a difference in the lives of people like Mrs. Bernard. And that's a hard balance to, to strike. And it is what we're going to continue to look into in this committee. Senator Tillis is right that there are some obvious bad actors out there. And we focused on them last year. I'll, I'll never forget uh, one of the CEOs when we were interviewing him uh, and we asked, why did you increase this drug, which you had no uh, involvement in developing overnight by an enormous percentage? And he said, because I can't. I mean, it was just a case of pure, simple greed. On the other hand, uh, the statistics that we know of how few drugs make it from the laboratory to the market and the cost of developing a new drug, which can be so expensive, uh, urges us to take a cautious approach and make sure uh, that we know what we're doing when we're dealing with legitimate uh, pharmaceutical companies as opposed to what I call hedge fund pharma, um, a term they don't like, by the way, but uh, it does seem appropriate in many ways. So I want to thank our witnesses for helping us better understand exactly the complexity of these issues, and yet I am determined that we end the abuses and that we also make life easier for patients like Mrs. Bernard, for whom I thank very much uh, for coming from Maine and sharing your story, and providers like Dr. Harvey who want only the best for their patients. So I thank all of you for being here today, and I thank our staff for their hard work also. Senator Casey. Thank you, uh, Chairman Collins, for this hearing, and also uh, I want to thank our witnesses for your presence here, your testimony, uh, and the time you took today, but also for helping us better understand uh, a number of these issues. We learned today that living, among other things we learned, we learned that living with arthritis is a common experience for so many Americans, especially uh, rheumatoid art arthritis. For people with arthritis, access to affordable and appropriate treatment is absolutely essential. We must promote pathways to foster innovation and promote access to life-changing medications. We must also ensure that baby boomers or older adults can afford the treatments that they work, uh, that work best for them. We thank you for your time today, and we're grateful that you took the time to be with us. Madam Chair, thank you for the hearing. Thank you. Committee members will have until Friday, February 16th to submit additional questions for the record, so there may be some coming your way. This concludes our hearing again. My thanks to all of our witnesses.